everyone. Welcome to the 193rd meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. This is back to one of our regular monthly meetings. Our prior meeting was sort of a special off-schedule meeting uh, at AppNexus. This one today is back to our regular schedule. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I know Friday is a little bit unusual for us, um, but um, here we are. Um, Tonight we are going to be hearing a talk on GNU PG and the future of OpenPGP by Daniel Kahn Gilmore or DKG. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg uh, for providing this great space and again thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. Um, you know we do this for you and uh, having you come out really you know we appreciate that. Um, tonight before we get started we have our usual requests. First silence your cell phones. Um, Two, uh, no snacks and noisy wrappers. Sorry, I'm hearing a few, so I'm going to pick on whoever that is. Uh, we really, it's incredibly disruptive to the speaker and to the audience. And yeah, I, I'm not going to count that until after I'm done talking. Um, please use the microphones for questions. Uh, DKG is happy to have uh, people interrupt questions. Uh, interrupt his, interrupt is the wrong word, but to uh, come up with their questions during the presentation. But to do so, please come up to the microphones. They will be on and uh, state your question and... Uh, you know, that will, uh, we don't normally do this, but it, it will work just fine as long as everybody is, uh, uh, yeah, cooperative. Thank you. Um, our next regular meeting will uh, be um, Barak Michener uh, with an overview of CoreOS for those of you who are interested in that technology. Um, we are looking forward to that presentation. That will be on Wednesday, June 17th here at Bloomberg. Um, in addition, we will be having an ad another ad special talk on June 29th. Leonard Pottering will be giving a special talk on SystemD uh, for anyone interested. Uh, that will be hosted by Facebook. We'll have more details on that, um, and the RSVP will open in a little bit. Um, as we always do, we'd like to thank our regular space sponsor here, Bloomberg, um, and our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, the Brandor Group. Uh, Brandor Group? The Brandor Group. I'm sorry, Brian. Um, uh, and... Um, Google and O'Reilly Media for their support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function uh, without our many volunteers who contributed greatly over the years, and you guys, you know, who are helping you direct you tonight uh, are among those volunteers, so uh, thank you. Um, after the meeting, we encourage uh, everyone to join us for more talks and drink at Bloom's Tavern, which is down the street at 208 East 58th Street. Uh, it's between 2nd and 3rd. Um, so, our announcements. Uh, for the workshops, please talk to Rob and David Bristow. They're right here. Uh, if you're interested in the workshop, the next one will be uh, at City College at 138th and Amsterdam on June 2nd. The uh, subsequent meetups will be uh, posted on our meetup page. Um, in case you missed it, you can grab a Linux distro DVD from out front. Uh, please, please, if you are interested, grab one, take it, try it out. Um, they're there for you, they're free to use, and they're yours to keep. Does anyone in the audience have any announcements? All right, that looks like a no. Um, so again, please, during the, during the uh, presentation, the microphones will be on. Feel free to stand up, go to the nearest microphone, get DKG's attention, and uh, ask your question if you have something that uh, is burning. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be trivia questions being asked by DKG and uh, be based on material during the presentation. Um, we, will be, we have four books and three ebook vouchers, but we will only be giving away as many as we have questions. Um, now, please welcome DKG with his talk about GNU PG and the future of Open P uh, <clears throat> Open PGP. Here we go, everyone. Thanks. Um, so, um, I uh, I want to talk to you guys about uh, Open PGP and GNU PG uh, just because I think it's it's some critically important pieces for the free software infrastructure, and I figure folks at Nylug are interested in that. Um, a bit about who I am, just a little bit. Um, so I'm a Debian developer, just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I do some work within the IETF. I work um, on uh, cryptic, uh, cryptographic communications and things like that. Um, I work currently for the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, in our speech privacy and technology project. So my goal is to uh, make sure that the uh, communications technologies that we use will continue to support the civil liberties that, that, uh, we, should all, that we all deserve. So I care about things like um, message confidentiality. I care about uh, authenticity on the network. I care about your ability to be anonymous on the network um, and private communication. Whole, the whole package of secure communication is what, uh, things that I'm interested in. 
open PGP is a part of that ecosystem, and it's not all of it. But I think it's a relevant part, um, and so I just wanted to um, to talk about where it's going because it's changing right now, and this is a it's an important underpinning um, for the tools that we all use. So um, I guess what I want uh, maybe what, maybe what I'll start with is um, who here has uh, who here has ever used a, an open PGP implementation, whether that's GNU PG or something else. Uh, all right, so almost everyone, maybe even everyone. So who here used one in the last week? And who here used one in the last day? Okay, so I actually think those of you who didn't raise your hands, oh, who, sorry, who here runs a Linux distribution on their computer? All right, those of you who raised your hands for that last question and didn't raise your hand for the previous questions are probably, were probably wrong about the earlier one. So um, this wasn't, wasn't meant to be a gotcha, but I just wanted to point out that OpenPGP and GNUPG are used in a lot of different places. And so the, the fact that these are relevant in some places is actually going to, it's actually going to be relevant across much more than maybe you thought. So everyone thinks of for OpenPGP, they think of mail as like the critical OpenPGP app. Can I send my encrypted mail so that my secret plans don't leak out to somebody who controls my mail server? Right? But in fact, people use it to do backups. They, there are signed and encrypted backups that people do. Um, people use it to distribute software, and that's the place where I suspect everybody who raised their hand who's running a Linux distribution actually did use OpenPGP. It was just in the background, and you didn't even know it. So if you use apt, or you use yum, or you use one of the other package managers, all, those, all that software is actually certified by your distribution, and your, your operating system won't actually fetch new packages um, if they haven't been uh, properly signed. So th those signatures are OpenPGP signatures, and they're verified by GNU PG. Um, and then there's also infrastructure tools uh, that, that may be less common. But for example, if you're a Debian developer and you want to upload a package to the archive, the archive isn't going to accept, the, uh, like, the Debian system, the Debian infrastructure contains um, lots of different pieces. But some of those pieces are like build daemons, right? I build a piece of software on my local workstation. My local workstation is running AMD64 architecture. But Debian distributes binaries for MIPS and you know, I386 and all kinds of other crazy things. So Debian has these build daemons, and they're going to run, they're, they're going to try to build the software that I just uploaded on these other architectures. But they're only going to do it if, if the software came from me. How do they know that it came from me? Again, they know it came from me because I've signed this, the package before I uploaded it, and then they can verify the signature, and that all uses OpenPGP as well. So that's an example of infrastructure. There are other places where you can see this in the infrastructure. Uh, if any of you control domain names, um, some, there are some domain name registrars who you can send PGP signed email to, to say, oh, you know, I've got an account with you. I want to register a new domain name. Please debit my account and register this domain name. And if it's a signed PGP email, they'll just accept the, the message. So you don't have to deal with any web forms or stuff. For people like me who can't stand working on the web, that's a nice thing. Um, so, so that's just the basic argument about why these things are useful. And by the way, I want to reiterate what Peter said. Um, if you have questions, please um, raise your hand or come up to the microphone. Um, I want you to ask your question at the microphone so that they can be recorded. Um, but, but let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to, to stop and have a conversation too. So just a little background about where OpenPGP comes from. I think it's kind of remarkable to think about the fact that we are using this, this technology that's basically, it's changed, but it's almost 25 years old now. Uh, PGP was dropped onto um, the sort of nascent internet in 1991. Um, this is before the web existed. Um, it was officially standardized by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, in RFC 1991 in 1996. Um, then there was a subsequent revision a couple of years later that actually did some major, major improvements. This was, 1991 was basically a documentation of the proprietary, um, of the formats that the, that the proprietary PGP software had used. Um, and tw uh, 2440 was a fix to a lot of the problems that there were with the PGP software. Um, and then 4880 came out in 2007, fixed a couple of more warts out of 2440, and this year we're actually starting to consider making yet another revision of the OpenPGP standard. So this is a 25-year history, or 24-year history at the moment, um, of tools that are still actually in, in pretty wide use, even if they're not for the email that you're talking about, uh, that, that you might think immediately, but they're actually in very wide use in terms of software distribution. Pretty much all of the servers that people probably run rely on this stuff to work. So. 
Now, I know I just mentioned PGP, and I talked about OpenPGP, and I talked about GNU PG, which is the implementation. So one of the problems with the OpenPGP space is that there's a lot of terminological confusion. And I'm someone who likes to have the words clear so that I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I just wanted to clear up a couple of pieces of terminology. So, so this, br this break up here, right, PGP was the original implementation that Phil Zimmerman made. Um, and that was pretty good privacy is what it stood for. And then when, they, when folks got together, documented it, and then did the first public revision, they, they call it open PGP here um, to distinguish that from what the PGP software was. Um, so the PGP software uh, is still made, although now it's called something like Symantec Desktop Encryption Suite or something. Does anybody know what the exact name is? It's no longer called PGP. Um, it, got, it went through a, a ch successive chain of corporate ownership. But then there's GNU PG, and this is the free software implementation, which is nearly as old as the PGP software. Not as old, but, quite, but it's, it goes back quite a long way, and it's still under active development. Um, so GNU PG is the GNU Privacy Guard, and it implements the open PGP standards, and it also tries to be backwards compatible with very old software as well sometimes. Um, so if you have a modern uh, GNU Linux operating system, you basically have GNU PG available to you. And this is the implementation of open PGP that, that probably everyone in this room uses. Um, so so what, is, what is open PGP? It's a crypto system at its core. It's a crypto system that works by dealing with, with, um, with encrypting objects, with signing objects. Um, and so it's, it's, it works in sort of a store and forward arrangement. So it's designed for a place like email, where you're going to take a message, you're going to do something to it, and you're going to pass that message off, and you hope that somebody can do the opposite thing at the other side. Um, and people, it, it's a public key crypto system. So for folks, um, Okay, so public key uh, uh, crypto systems are sort of a complicated thing, and I'm not actually going to go into the details of the math in this talk. Anybody who's interested in the details of the math, it's fascinating stuff. I invite you to come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, but the basic idea behind a public key crypto system is that you will have a mathematical object that's your secret key, and you can take a transformation of that secret object and it creates a public object. And you can publish that. Everybody can see that public object then people can do things like encrypt a message to, your, to that public object, the public key, and then the only person who will be able to reverse that encryption would be whoever holds the secret object, the secret key. So fundamentally, in OpenPGP, you've got these keys that are these critical objects for, being, for, for, for passing around and for thinking about when you think about how the crypto system works. It's not just like, it's not a shared secret arrangement. Right? A shared secret is where the two parties both know the same thing, like, I know that I set my secret decoder ring at 7, and you set yours at 7, and now you encrypt your message and it comes through. That's a shared secret. This is, a, this is, our, this is an asymmetric system that doesn't work that way. And so you need, to, you need to have these keys that you pass around so that you know who you're encrypting messages to. So we have a lot of, there's a terminology, this is a terminology confusion slide as well. <laughs> so there is this fundamental mathematical object that's called a public key in any public key crypto system. And there are different variants of public keys and different sizes, and we can get into all that. Um, but there is this primitive element that's a mathematical object called a key. But in the open PGP world, we also call a key, what's, what's your PGP key? We use it to refer to an entire chunk of data, not just the mathematical object. It includes data like um, when was the key created. It includes data like who does the key belong to. And it includes certifications that's, that are cryptographic signatures that say this key belongs to this identity. So. All that stuff mushed together, people sometimes call a key. I'd like to call it a key block, but actually I prefer to call it a certificate because that's really what it's doing. P the key, I like to preserve key for the actual mathematical object that's a key. And a certificate is the piece that says identity and public key, they belong together. Um, so if you catch me saying one or the other, just remember that these things are slightly different. Um, and uh, again, for the different actions that, that you can do in a public key crypto system, signing and encrypting, you can certify, so you can, you can say this key belongs to this person. You can decrypt an uh, encrypted object, and you can verify a signature. So there's a range of different things that you can do. Um, but you'll also hear people talk about trust. And this gets very confusing because there's lots of different things that trust might mean. 
So I'm going to skip over this slide briefly and just point out that you might see all of these terms in different places. And when you see those terms, someone is probably making a mistake by exposing the user to these terms. <laughs> so, um, uh, right. So, so let me talk a little bit about the history and why we are, why are we, we're here in 2015. Um, do folks have any other, any questions, by the way? Um, okay. So, so there's been this history, this, this transformation of the PGP standard. The, the original version of PGP had a lot of flaws, that many of which have been fixed. But the current version still has some flaws. And modern cryptography has changed. Computers have changed. Um, the things that we used to think were OK to do are now no longer. Um, the world has changed, and, th and our knowledge has changed. And so the, the things that we used to think were OK, we're starting to realize there may be better ways of doing it. So there's some trouble with the older versions, the particularly old stuff, this RFC 1991 stuff, the, the original version of PGP, we know to be broken, actually. There are a number of ways that, th that they're broken that you can't rely on the really old stuff. Um, this, the later versions, the 2440 and 4880, um, are not uh, known to be broken, but we know that there are some significant problems with them, and we can see that they'll break relatively soon. So we have this trouble ahead here. Um, or trouble afoot. Um, the old crypto. So there are message digests that uh, we know are bad. Open PGP, the more modern stuff, doesn't use MD5 at all. But the older version, the 1991 stuff, does actually use MD5 and in some cases relies on it. This is a message digest that we know is, is broken. Um, we know people have some small keys. Um, so these are the public keys that we're talking about. If those keys are small, then an attacker can actually take the public object and mathematically derive, maybe with a big compute farm, but mathematically derive what the secret objects are. And from then on, they can masquerade as the person who controls the, public, who controls the secret key. Um, the DSA algorithm itself, this is one of the algorithms for public key algorithms. The DSA algorithm itself is problematic in the way that it's generally implemented. Um, if you choose your random numbers wrong once with DSA, so if someone can predict what your random numbers are, then they can actually figure out what your secret key is if they know what random number you chose, if, as long as you've made one signature from a predictable random number source. Um, and then there are older symmetric ciphers that we're getting rid of as well. So there's a bunch of cleanup that we need to do um, to make sure, sort of muck out the stables, make sure that, that stuff that we know is broken isn't there anymore. Um, and V3, like I said, is fundamentally broken. Um, and lastly, the, there's a part of OpenPGP that specifies how very large messages are encrypted. And that part, um, was designed at a time when we didn't really understand uh, large symmetric encryption very well. Um, in particular, it fails. You can fiddle with the ciphertext. So, sorry, um, ciphertext. Let me unpack that. So, ciphertext. If you take a you take a secret uh, you take a, an, an object that you want to encrypt, and then you encrypt it. The the object before encryption is the clear text, and the object after encryption is the ciphertext. So. Um, if you fiddle with the ciphertext of an old-style PGP message, then the clear text that comes out when you decrypt it will change. But there's no indication that it's actually been tampered with. And in modern crypto, we know that one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that people can actually maintain the integrity of the message across, uh, across transmission. We can't rely on anybody to do that. Um, except for our mathematics. So we want to make sure that the OpenPGP in the newer versions has a, has a sort of, I would call it a half-assed way to try to do this message integrity protection um, that probably will work most of the time, but it's nowhere near as good as what we know to be um, mathematically desirable. So we want to fix this stuff as well. Um, and then there's another, a bunch of other sort of small problems that we also want to deal with that are related to the way the crypto system is used in the world, not just the math, but the way that it's used in the world. So um, who here has sent an encrypted email? All right, lots of people have. And who here has received an encrypted email? All right. And who has looked at an encrypted email in the, in the encrypted form, looked at the raw source of your encrypted mail? OK, so those of you who have looked at the raw source of your encrypted mail probably recognize that one of the things that's not encrypted in your mail is the headers. So I mean, to and from, OK, maybe we think you have to have the header so that the message can get where it's going on the network. But you certainly don't need to leave the subject in the clear. 
right? So there's a number of things that we've been doing for a very long time where the encryption worked well enough, it worked close enough, but we forgot, and hey, we didn't really get this subject part. So we really need to look at the, the broader ecosystem and figure out how to clean up that metadata. Um, there's also a habit people have of key IDs. So that we were just talking actually before this started about, hey, someone's going to end up with a key ID of, uh, of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, when's that going to happen? Well, the answer is I actually have that key ID. Um, so I don't, I don't use it, but I actually have every possible key ID. Um, because I wrote a little program that runs for a couple of hours on a laptop and it generates all possible key IDs. So we really shouldn't be relying on key IDs because they're trivially bro broken. In fact, um, Keith Packard, uh, I don't know if you all, do you all know Keith Packard? He's a hacker who works on the X11 uh, graphical windowing system. So Keith Packard's key, um, let's see here. Uh, Keith Packard's key, you might not be able to see that. I don't know if that's big enough. Um, but so his key is 0x000011, because he works on X11. <laughs> um, so th th this should just um, reassure you that you probably don't want to be dealing with short key IDs. Now you'll note that Keith did not modify the, um, the longer key ID, which is here, and he did not modify, he didn't manage to co corrupt the entire fingerprint. Um, but he, did, but he did manage to set this last bit, which is the key ID. So um, let me explain what we're looking at for people who haven't used this stuff before. So, um, okay, so what we're looking at here, this is a key ID. So I, I used GPG, uh, which is the command line version of the GNU PG project. And I said, show me the key that has this fingerprint, 11. And GPG has a key ring locally. Uh, that contains, they call it a key ring, but again, it's actually sort of a set of certificates. And it contains a bunch of certificates, and it knows the, the certificates by what keys are in them and by what user IDs are associated with them. Um, and so here you can see, this is, the, this is the key ID, this is the long key ID, which is just the short key ID with more of a prefix, and then the full fingerprint, which contains the, short key, the long key ID and the short key ID in it. So those identify the keys. These are just message digests of the, of the raw key material, more or less. And then these are user IDs that are associated with the key. So this is, this is Keith Packard's key here. Um, but, and it's actually, like I said, it's sort of a certificate. I want to take a second and go into the idea of an open PGP certificate. Because those of you who have an open PGP key, maybe I'll ask that too. Who has an open PGP key that's active and valid and not expired and not revoked? I don't know what it is. That's OK. You don't have to know what it is. I, I don't know off the top of my head what my fingerprint is either. But I do have it on my, on my business card. But so let me. Let me, um, let me go through a little, walk through what's, what's in an open PGP certificate. Uh, can folks see this? All right. So this is the structure of an open PGP certificate. Um, and I'm going to go into the pieces of it. Uh, um, this, is, this is just a representation of the structure. But I want to walk into the, into the little pieces so that we can see what they are. So, um, so when you get somebody's key, if you pull it off the key servers, I'll talk about the key servers in a minute, but if you, if you pull it from their website or whatever, when you pull in their key, it has lots and lots of information. It looks just like a big blob of ASCII garbage, but it can be parsed into this particular structure. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the details. This dot, 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 and these stacks means there might be more than one. So your primary, it has a primary key that is associated with a user ID, and then it's signed. So this bit here, sorry for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, so this represents here a cryptographic signature made by this primary key over this user ID. So what does this mean? This certification means that someone says, my name is Jane Doe, I have this email address, and this public key, referring to this particular green one, is the public key that I use to make certifications, like this certification I just made of my own key. So just to look back at that for a second, right? So that's that first bit. But now there's this other bit that's this red bit. So this is a certification from someone else, not from the key holder. And it says that Jane Doe has this primary key. But what's, important, what's different about it is that it's being said by someone else. So. So here, this might be me, and I might have certified it. <clears throat> and I've certified it with my own key, which is a different, a different key. Um, I'm just doing different colors, but of course, there's a wide range of keys, not just, not just a different set of colors. 
But so that is what that, that third party certification says. And then in addition, so actually, sorry, let me look at, look at that for a second here. So, so you'll notice that there could be multiple ones of these. There could be lots of different people who all say this key belongs to this user ID. And there could be multiple user IDs on the primary key. So the same person with the same primary key could say, by the way, I'm also known as. You'll find if you look at mine, I mean, you saw in the, in, in the intro slide, I have a couple different public email addresses. I have user IDs for each of those email addresses. So, um, so let's look at this subkey business. So an open PGP certificate is not, it turns out, just a public key and user IDs and certifications on it. It also has these extra pieces. And these extra pieces are important because cryptographically, you don't actually want to use the same key material for two different uses. Um, one of the reasons you might not want that is because there could be a way to use a key in context A, say, message signing, and if somebody could coax you to sign just the right message, maybe they could take that signature and turn around and use it to decrypt something that had been encrypted to the same key. So you want to split out the uses of your keys. And so OpenPGP has this concept of subkeys, and a subkey binding signature like that is, this is Jane again saying, anyone can use this public key, and notice it's a different key, to encrypt messages to me. But this whole message that she's saying is certified by her primary key. So those are the same thing. Um, so this is, this is the structure of, these, of this kind of certificate. And you can see here, you can also have multiple subkeys. So you can have a subkey that is a, um, right, you can have this one subkey that's, that's for encryption. You could have another subkey for different uses. So for example, I have a subkey that's used for SSH. So I can take that key and I can use it to connect to SSH servers. Um, and I can distribute it to SSH servers because they, they just need to find my certificate and extract the key from it. And then they can be configured to use that key for SSH access. So when we talk about these keys, and I, sorry, and so I, I just showed you this, um, I just showed you this Keith Packard scenario here where he's got 0x11, right? We refer to keys, we refer to them by these sort of shortcuts, by these fingerprints. Um, so as I said, Key IDs are bad news because they're trivially forgeable. Long key, key IDs cost a lot more to forge, but I suspect actually they're forgeable by someone today. Um, not by me, not on my laptop in two hours, the way that the short key, key IDs are. But these long fingerprints, I, we actually have good reason to believe are not actually forgeable right now. Um, and so that's a great thing. It means, it means that if you can tell someone your fingerprint, then you can get that fingerprint across to them then they can go find your key somewhere else and they'll have gotten the exact key. So it reduces the problem from you having to give them a page of complicated ASCII gibberish containing all of this stuff to just giving them this one fingerprint. So the different ways we can get that fingerprint to people are, um, so sorry, this is, uh, I thought I'd pulled out that elliptic curves business there. So this is a traditional way that we've, that we've done it, is we've, we've published them like this, and people read it. Or you look at that, you know, you look at Keith's fingerprint there. But humans aren't actually very good at that. Um, so instead, I actually recommend that you transmit it this way. Humans are even worse at this, but at least we don't try. Right? You can, you can, have, you can have a machine just take a picture of this. Anybody here who has a barcode reader um, is actually welcome to take a picture of it. And this contains my fingerprint. Um, so people are actually really bad at comparing um, hexadecimal strings. In a lot of situations, if you give someone, so my business card has my fingerprint printed on it um, down at the bottom in small text so that it fits all the way across. Um, but people will look at that fingerprint and then maybe they'll look at the first couple of digits and the last couple of digits, but they often won't look at the whole thing all the way through. Um, and if a machine scans it, then you have to have optical character recognition, which itself has problems. So I say, just let it go through um, in an automatic way. My, fin my business card also has a, a QR code on the back. So I can give this to people, and people who can scan these things can make that work. So if you're a free software hacker and you want to build tools that are useful for handing keys around, um, you could do a lot worse than to write a tool that does something like this. If you run Android, you might be interested in installing a tool called Open Keychain that knows how to scan these, um, these fingerprints and work with them. Um, there's a tool called Monkey Sign that's a, for, for desktop use that does the same thing. Um, 
So this is, I think, a better way to get fingerprints across. And as, as, we, as we move into the new era of OpenPGP, I suspect we'll, look at, we'll see more interesting ways of, of distributing fingerprints like this. There's another technique called safe slinger that people use to, to make it so that when you get together in person, everybody can get everybody else's keys, and uh, you can work from there. So, um, so sorry, so let me, let me switch back here. So, so key IDs was one piece of the sort of trouble afoot that I had. Um, another problem is that people tend to put comments in their user IDs, which I don't particularly like. Um, I think it tends to be a mistake, and we've had a terrible, terrible user interface and user experience for many, many years, some of this from GNU PG, some of it inherited from PGP, and some of it from other tools, that encourages people to do basically bad things, like putting in a comment. So you'll often see people who have a user ID that says, you know, Jane Doe, and then in parenthesis it'll say, I like strawberries, jane at example.org. And Jane probably put that in because GNU PG, when you say, let's make a new key, it says, what's your name, what's your comment, and what's your email? So you know, the usual user experience when you're confronted with a question like, what's your comment, is first the head scratch, and then, well, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I like strawberries. So, so that's the sort of thing that actually hasn't been fixed until relatively recently, just to show you how low the bar is for people who have user interface experience and user experience um, um, uh, skills looking at these tools and trying to improve them. So if you're, if you're a usability nut, and you want a place where a little bit of effort can actually probably go a long way, I thoroughly encourage you to take a look at these tools because there's lots of improvement to be made and there's people who are, who are eager to get that kind of feedback and to, think, to, to start thinking better than, than what we've done um, in the past. So, um, so those are things that, yeah, you know, sure, come up to the mic. Yep. Yeah. So let me, I, I I will briefly address the sort of. Um, so the question was, if that mic wasn't working, the question was about um, the critique that was raised by Moxie Marlin Spike recently um, about OpenPGP and GNU PG in general. Um, and you know, are there lessons learned? Um, so Moxie's rant, um, I'm not going to do him justice to try to recapitulate it, but I'll give a rough sketch of it. He basically said, open PGP it is incredibly difficult for people to use. It uh, doesn't provide some things that we know we would like to provide, things like forward secrecy. Um, it causes people confusion about figuring out whose key is whose. Um, and uh, it's basically been a many decade long failure because it's had so little adoption. So I think Moxie is right about good chunks of that, but his conclusion that he drew, which was throw the whole thing away, we've got some new crypto systems coming up, we should just use those, um, I am not convinced that that actually is gonna do any better. Um, so what I would like to do is to learn from his critiques, um, which I think we have been, um, and and try to address them and try to actually make a new crypto system that will take advantage of some of the strengths of OpenPGP um, and some of the strengths of, Moxie's, of, of the kind of work that Moxie is doing. So in particular, um, one of Moxie's critiques is about the, um, is about the, the message integrity. Uh, so he, he has some critiques that, that I mentioned earlier, right, about the way the message integrity fails. And um, he has some critiques about it lacking forward secrecy, um, but the places where Moxie is working tend to be in very ephemeral contexts, not in a sort of store and forward context, not in an archival context, right? He's working on things like chat protocols. You had mentioned OTR. I actually didn't know Moxie was working on OTR, but I know he's working on Axolotl, which is sort of like next-gen OTR. So working in that context. 
Um, OTR is an encrypted chat protocol um, that uses some of the same underlying math in very different ways. Um, so I think that your incentives and your data structures change depending on the context in which you're working. And if people want to continue to use OpenPGP in some of these contexts, it's still very useful and very relevant. And Moxie's rant in particular was about, for in was about encrypted messaging. And I think he's not taking into account some of the, the, the broader use cases. I do agree with him that OpenPGP has effectively been a failure because everybody doesn't currently use it. Um, and, and that's a failure. Like, we need to fix that. Um, but I'm not sure that the way that we fix it is that we jump to a new protocol, especially one that has real problems with federation. Um, so one of the advantages of the way this certification mechanism works that, that I just displayed earlier is that anybody can certify anybody else. So that means that there isn't a centralized authority, and it, meant, it means that people who have different perspectives on the world can learn different things. Um, I don't recommend that everyone certifies everyone else, but it, does, but it does mean that we're not reliant on, say, one phone book. We can have a variety of different people making statements about who's who on the network. The tools that Moxie has built, in particular uh, Tech Secure, which is being used also in WhatsApp and other places, they basically rely for deciding on whose key is whose on a central server, right? You talk to the server and, the ser and you tell the server, I'm interested in phone number X. And the server comes back and says, sure, the, the, the public key to use for phone number X is this. So why is that a problem? Right? It's a problem because if, yeah, if, this, if, the, ser if the server is your adversary, then the server can um, give you the wrong key. And now you encrypt your message to that key and then you send the message off and the server then plucks the message off the network and decrypts it because it controls, it actually gave you its own key and you just encrypted to it because you believed it. So if you're, if, right, so in, with OpenPGP, particularly in the email context, the adversary is assumed to be in control of the network and in control of your mail server. So if you go to all of the, to those places and you say, hey, what's the right key? And they say, well, th here's the key and you believe them, then you just lost to your adversary. So. There are ways that I think we could make use of mail servers knowing what the key is, so that cooperating mail servers can give you that information, and then maybe you can corroborate it via other channels. Um, and I think some of those recommendations are good. But in Moxie's, in, in the tech secure arrangements that are set up right now, none of that corroboration seems to actually be happening. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can do some out-of-band corroboration, and they are at least as difficult to use as it turns out OpenPGP is to use. Um, so what I really do like about what Moxie's done is that he's made it much easier for people to sort of get their feet wet, even if they don't go all the way through to protecting themselves all the way um, against all these different kinds of attacks, people can start using the tool and then figure out how to level up their security later. Whereas OpenPGP was originally designed as sort of, let's make it only work for the most absolutely perfect case. So those are some things that I think we should be learning from. Sorry, just checking the mic. This one's working yep, now. So that's if we good. have more questions. Um, so, right, and then we have these other fixes that are mathematical fixes, cryptographic fixes, um, new, new algorithms that we want to use and some tweaks to some old ones that we want to use. But so we just talked a little bit about this certification question and I want to I touch on that. Um, so, so the reason that we care is because if you don't know who you're talking to, you don't have secure communication, right? You don't have encrypted communication if you don't know who you're talking to. and it's not just about private communication. If, if all you care that is that the, the packages that you download for your operating system are signed by some open PGP key, then anybody can, get, can, can make you run arbitrary code because they can just sign it with some other PGP key, right? So it's critically important that we know whose key is whose. Um, and so this certification mechanism that we've got is with OpenPGP is one way of doing that. It's these, it's these certificates that say this public key belongs to this identity and they can be certified by other folks. So what are the other approaches? I can, if you want to shout one out, I can echo it back so it doesn't. So the certificate authority model, right? So the certificate authority model is what we use on the web. So that's X509 certificates and they are certified by one of the CAs. Um, and the CAs are, are, right, CA stands for certificate authority. Your web browser, by default, comes pre-configured to rely, without question, on at least uh, 30 certificate authorities. 
Anybody, can anybody name some certificate authorities that are active in your CA? VeriSign, Komodo, the Chinese Network Information Center. That's, yes, there is, they, they've actually just been pulled out. Um, Mozilla actually just removed CNNIC, which was the Chinese government's um, CA, because they, um, they certified a sub-CA. CAs can delegate their magical superpower, global identification power, to any other sub, uh, subordinate certificate authority. They had certified a subordinate certificate authority that it turned out was making bad certifications, which they claim it was making bad certifications because it was doing some kind of internal enterprise testing thing. Who knows? Um, but CNNIC is, you know, if, if we're ta fr from a U.S. perspective, people are like, oh, CNNIC, that's the Chinese government. That's super scary, right? But if you were a Chinese citizen who had trust in your government, you would actually find VeriSign to be extremely scary because VeriSign is an American corporation subject to all the laws of the, of the United States and, you know, has a, is, you know, has one of their heavily paying customers probably is the U.S. government. So VeriSign themselves might have some incentives to um, work against people whose interests are not in line with the U.S. government. There's also the government of Turkey, and there's uh, um, there's, the, there's a Brazilian Internet Authority. There's a bunch of other governmental authorities if you're scared of governments. And if you're not scared of governments but you're scared of corporations, there's lots of corporate authorities as well. So, and, and the CA model is weakest link in the chain, right? If any one of all the CAs decides to do the wrong thing, then the whole system kind of collapses. So the CA model has these problems. The CA model, um, the, the problems exist in the CA model for a number of different reasons. And there's lots of ways that we can sort of patch and shore up the CA system. And we're working on that as well. Um, so one of the ways that we're shoring that, that system up, um, which is not related to OpenPGP, um, is uh, if you run a website and you get, and it's HTTPS, because all of your websites are HTTPS, right? <laughs> Good, right? Because you should, that's like, that should be the bare minimum for having a secure communication on the network. Um, if, you, if your website is now certified, you pick a CA, right? You pick uh, Komodo. Um, so you pick Komodo, Komodo certifies your website. Um, but of course, any other CA could also make a certificate that identifies your website. In that situation, you might want to say, actually, I only want Komodo to make certificates for my website. And then anybody who is browsing the web and f runs across your site and says, oh, it's actually not certified by Komodo, will know that something is amiss. That's called public key pinning. Um, there's a number of different me mechanisms like that that are set up um, and that are starting to be used. But it's very slow going. There's another mechanism just to say, if you're a public certificate authority, we want you to log every certificate you've ever issued. And that's called certificate transparency. Um, and that's a, it's a global append-only log of all certificates that have ever been issued. And that way you, cannot, you can't prevent the CAs from acting bad, but you can at least tell when they've done it. Um, so what's interesting about the certificate transparency model, which is a way to address um, a problem in the, in the certificate authority model, is that it has this global append-only log. Right? So that smells a lot like the key servers. So OpenPGP that doesn't do this as rigorously as, uh, as certificate transparency does. But OpenPGP has for years used this mechanism for key distribution. So, so what, are, what are the key servers? Um, who here has interacted with the key servers knowingly recently in the last month? OK. So there's a handful of folks who have done this. The key servers are a global pool of, of, of um, servers that communicate with each other. They run a gossip protocol. Um, where each server talks to a handful of other servers and says, hey, I've got these certificates with these certifications. Um, which ones do you have that I don't have? And then I'll pull the differences. And then, and vice versa. And so they go around trading these certifications and eventually everybody has all of them until somebody uploads a new, a new key. Um, so it, this is actually a global append-only pool. Um, so if you want to publish something in a way that would be very difficult to have it taken down, you can just push your key up to this key server and everybody will see it. You can also use this for revocation. So one of the things that you can do in, um, in your certificate, in addition to saying this is my key, is you can do a special signature on it that's a revocation that says, actually this key is no good anymore at all. Never rely on it again. 
When you publish this revocation, the key is dead. The key servers will also distribute the revocation. So there's a lot of problems with the key server infrastructure, um, but we've been doing this for quite a long time, and the X519 folks are sort of just now coming around to thinking about, about doing a similar project. They're doing it in a much more rigorous and probably better mathematical way than the key servers are. Um, um, so sorry, short digression on the key servers. So if you use key servers, this is the key server to use. In GPG, that's, a, that's the dash dash key server option. You can put it in your gpg.conf, just put a line that says key server pool.sks-keyservers.net. This is the identity of a, uh, a DNS round robin that is updated regularly to know which, which key servers are functioning. So you might, you might put pgp.mit.edu in there. That's a popular one that people put in. The trouble with that is if the operator of pgp.mit.edu goes on vacation and the server crashes, now you can't fetch revocation certificates. Now you can't get updates. You can't push your new key to the key servers. You can't work, you can't work with the key servers anymore. Um, this is a regularly updated round robin to any, to any one of the keys that are of, of the key servers that are active in the pool. And if a key server falls behind, if it's failing to gossip properly, this round robin will be updated to know about that and won't point you towards that server anymore. So this is the one to use. This should be the default. Um, hopefully, we'll get it changed so that it is the default in the future. Um, the protocol that you use to talk to the key servers is just the web protocol. It's HTTP, but with a special paths that you use to access the right kind of keys. So that put together is the HTTP key protocol. So it's uh, 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 acronyms nested within acronyms, HKP. Um, if you don't like the idea when you go out to fetch your keys that you're publishing a list of the keys you're interested in across the global internet and then the keys come back, you might say, listen, I'm willing to leak the list of keys that I'm interested in to the key server, but there's no reason why my network provider should need to know what those keys are. In that case, there's a new protocol that we've been using, which is HKPS, which is really just HKP over TLS. Um, and it runs on port 443, so it looks like to firewalls that you're doing a regular HTTPS connection, the firewalls can't inspect the traffic. Um, and uh, there is a HKPS pool as well, that's just HKPS.pool. Um, again, you're still opening yourself up to everybody who runs the key servers, but you're at least not opening your, yourself up to your network operator. Or some individual key servers offer HKPS service as well. So if, you, if you're willing to take the hit that if the key server goes away, you can deal with that, um, you can use HKPS. Jeremy. If you use HKPS, are you uh, still leaking the keys by traffic analysis? Right, that's a great question. So, uh, so traffic analysis looks, uh, looks at the size and timing of the records that are sent on the wire and doesn't look at the content. Um, so if I say to the key server, I would like these four keys. Well, what I say to the key server is I hand them actually the, the fingerprints of the keys that I'm looking for. The fingerprints are all the exact same length. So that's not gonna be a leak. What's gonna leak is the responses from the key server, right? My open PGP certificate is a certain length because it's got my picture in it and it's got certifications and it's got a certain number of user IDs and all of that stuff together makes it a certain length. And it would be pretty easy to take a list of all of the keys on the key server and see how big they are. And probably there's only one that's exactly as long as my key is. So if the TLS connection around HKP doesn't protect the content, uh, it does protect the content, but it doesn't protect the size, then yeah, um, someone who's observing it could see which key was requested just by lining it up, unless my key, ha unless the, the certificate requested happened to be exactly the same size as another certificate. Uh, but it would, be a, it would seriously narrow things down. So that is a great point. Um, I don't know of anyone who's actively doing that kind of traffic analysis, but if they were doing it, why would they tell us? Um, <laughs> so uh, actually, you know what this, what this points out is that all of these mechanisms are actually interrelated in some way, right? So, if we're gonna fix OpenPGP properly, we also have to fix TLS. So I actually have a proposal in to the TLS working group so that the next version of TLS will actually include padding abilities. And then you could configure your key servers to provide padding um, that would defeat size-based traffic analysis um, for the keys. So it doesn't solve all of the problems um, and the fixes outside of OpenPGP, but that's something that, that we do need to address. So, um, 
So, okay, so that little digression around how we get to, to key servers. Um, so, uh, and I'd asked what other alternatives. So, um, Chris, you had mentioned uh, the CA system. What are some other alternatives besides OpenPGP's sort of web of trust? This WOT stands for web of trust. Um, I actually don't like the term web of trust, but I'm going to ignore that for now. What are the other alternatives th that are out there? Trust on first use, yes. Uh, the acronym for that is TOFU. Uh, I love TOFU. Um, so TOFU is actually really, it's, it's, it's very handy because in, in practice that often is the only thing you've got, right? Uh, you, you talk to somebody, you, say, you send them an email, you say, hey, do you have a PGP key? And they say, sure, here it is, and they email it back to you. Well, that's not secure at all, right? Because clearly if there's an adversary in the middle of it, they could be sending you the, the bad key. But hey, maybe my first connection wasn't compromised, and I'm protecting myself for future connections. So okay, maybe it's worth paying the, the risk up front there, because it's so easy, right? It's so much easier than thinking about networks of certification and who, whose certifications am I willing to rely on, and you know, wait, now I have to go gather certifications before I publish my key, and there's all these extra steps that come back to this certification process. Whereas trust on first use is just like, oh yeah, done. Like, th there, there's no work, you don't need a centralized authority, you don't need uh, distributed authority, you don't need any of it, it's just there. So I think trust on first use is a great model. Um, I don't think it's great in the sense of cryptographically perfect, but I think it's great in the sense of like, everybody should just be using it. Why are we not using that, right? It's, it's way better than clear text. Um, so what's interesting about all of these, the, so, uh, sorry, are there other alternatives people wanted to mention? Probably people should mention their fingerprints and all their knowledge and all their certifications. So publish your fingerprint in other places, in your posts and public communications on your Twitter homepage. Homepage? What do you call it on Twitter? <laughs> your Twitter page? I'm sorry. Um, so, so right, so that again could be compromised if somebody manages to control all of your network services, but maybe it's less likely. So this is a way that you could have some sort of corroboration. Yeah, so Keybase is an interesting thing. I don't feel like I fully understand Keybase very well, but the basic idea is that it wants to tie your open PGP identity to your social media identities. Um, and so that's a, a form, a, a sort of standardized form of the corroboration via these other network presences that you mentioned. Yeah. Decentralized blockchain, that comes up a lot, right? You can just say, hey, I'm gonna put my identity with my public key into the blockchain, like Bitcoin someplace, and people will look it up and you can see that mine is the first one in the blockchain. So that's an interesting idea. It's again, we're back to global decentralized append only logs. That's what a blockchain is. We could just use that. Sorry? DNSSEC, right. So we, ha we control the domain name system or some of us feel like we control parts of the domain name system or some of us <laughs> hope we control parts of the domain name system. And we have this cryptographic mechanism we can use that says, that the DNS is signed properly, that's DNSSEC, so why don't we just put our keys in there? And indeed, we have some specifications where you can publish your open PGP key in the DNS. You can also publish your X509 uh, certificates in the DNS as well. So right, so DNSSEC is another, another option. Uh, other hands? So the, the risk there, of course, with the DNS is that there's ways you can compromise. The DNS is a, a hierarchical chain of authority. If you don't trust the root or you don't trust dot com or you don't trust the operator of foo.com and your email address is you know joe at foo.com then you're out of luck um, but if you if you think you can rely on those folks then that's a great arrangement and it's 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 better than tofu and better than 30 cas yeah it, it 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 puts all the eggs in one basket sort of right which is probably better than having 30 baskets any one of which can fail and drop all the eggs <laughs> Brian? I don't know the name for it, but what would it be if you called Yeah, call them and talk to them over the phone or, or, or you know, use Firefox Hello or, you, you know, there's a lot of different mechanisms you can use to try to transmit this. Some of them are more secure than others. The, again, with the original OpenPGP model was we want to get this as secure as possible. We don't want to allow wiggle room for things to fail. So the traditional PGP model is, well, give someone out of band, off net, your fingerprint, 
and then they can get your key from there. But in, in the real world, most of us don't have the luxury of doing that. So just using other mechanisms, and again, this just provides additional corroborative paths. Use a telephone, use chat. If you do this kind of communication in real time, it raises the bar for an attacker. It doesn't raise it infinitely high, but it's much easier for, an, if you're sending them an email and they don't check their email except for every two days, then an attacker who has to do some computational work to do the attack can just do the work when, you know, during those two days. If you're doing it in real time and the attack has to, has to modify your traffic in real time, that's, that's a harder job. So yeah, so that's an additional way that people can get this information around. So anybody else? I, I, I love this brainstorm stuff because I'd like to come up with new ones. Yep. So the operating, your operating system, you know, you trust your tools to not betray you, um, or you hope your tools don't betray you. If they do, you're kind of screwed anyway, because they could just tell you you have the right key when you don't. Um, so if the operating system itself can ship well-known important keys, then you can rely on the operating system as a sort of introduction mechanism. And in fact, you'll find that Debian and Ubuntu and probably Fedora all have ways that you can fetch the keys of relevant um, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu uh, developers through the operating system itself, through apt or yum. Um, so, right, so we have all these other alternatives. And what's interesting about the OpenPGP ecosystem is that you can do basically all of them with OpenPGP. So there's room to do these kind of corroborative paths in all of the different mechanisms that people have proposed so far. And OpenPGP provides a couple of standards and a couple of ways that you can communicate clearly to do that kind of, of uh, communication. And so, so it's handy because it provides you a way to take care of asking these questions and you can sort of raise the bar. So I think the old OpenPGP model of everybody has to do it in person with the you know, fig physical fingerprint, you know, that's great if you can do it, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't limit OpenPGP to people who can figure out how to do that and actually get their work to print their fingerprint on their business card or whatever. You just get the information out there and start using it. Or, or fall back to Tofu, because that's real, real easy. And then later on you can find out whether you got it wrong. But at least you ha there's only one place to be compromised instead of all the way down the line. So if we have this wide range of ways that we can do it, uh, that we can do this sort of this certificate uh, validation, um, should you certify other people's keys? So OpenPGP has, unlike the X509 world, where there's only a set of specific certificate authorities who can sign keys, in OpenPGP anyone is potentially a certificate authority. Now, people probably won't rely on your certificates. Um, most people won't. But maybe there are some situations where it's useful for you to sign keys. So, so what are some of the trade-offs about doing, so you might have heard of a key signing. Um, there's gonna be a PGP key signing. People have offered already to do key signings before the talk got started. Um, so really that, meaning, that means make, make an additional certification on a key. Um, so should you sign someone's key? What, what are the rules for signing keys? Anybody have any, any rules that, that they follow that they want to share? Yeah, know who they are. Because remember, remember this, you know, what, what the certificate is saying. You know, when you sign someone's keys, you're back to, um, you're saying that, right? You're making a statement publicly with your key that you believe this thing. So you should believe not just that you know the key, but you should also believe this other business here. Um, so know this information. So how do you know that someone is Jane Doe? Photo ID, right, people tend to rely on government issued identification. If the government's your adversary, maybe you don't want to rely on government issued identification. Um, people, uh, you know, some people I've known for 10 years, they've always told me that their name is X. I've always talked to them as X. I don't actually care about government issued ID. So in some cases, the knowledge comes from just life experience. Um, I've exchanged emails with them that can verify this part of it. So, so sorry, I'm asking about, so this is me here. I'm asking about when should I be me and make this certification, right? So, so well, in, in this scenario, I'm the one making the certification. So the question is, am, when should I make the certification? You could put your own face there and think about it for yourself, right? But another, so another way that people will look at keys and say, is the key valid, 
That's a different question. Is this, does, does this key belong to this person? That's a separate question from should I certify it? So certainly you only want to certify it if you believe it's valid, um, if you believe that the key belongs to the person. Um, but you could also just decide that it's valid and decide to not certify the key. There's no reason that you have to certify a key that you believe to, be, that you believe to belong to a given person, right? And once you do a certification, you could publish it to the public key servers. Um, but you might not want to. So when is, when is it good to publish your certifications and when is it bad? What are some trade-offs here? Yeah. So the, the theory here is legal liability. What if you sign someone's key and then that person is found guilty of a heinous crime and, uh, and now you've signed your key, you've just admitted that you believe you know what their key is. Well, I, I would hope that a judge who understands enough of what we've talked about today wouldn't think that <laughs> that, that meant that you were culpable. But in fact, the judges are often not particularly technically clueful. Um, and it just looks like an association. Somebody could paint the picture of you guys were buddies, you know, you, you planned it with them, you colluded it with them. Another reason is the opposite reason. If you think you might get in trouble, then you might not want to sign somebody else's key because you might not want, when you get in trouble, you don't want to take them down. Right? Because you're basically saying, I know who this person is and it's important to me to state this publicly and now all of a sudden I get taken down, that could be, that could be a bigger risk. Right. Bernie, Madoff. Uh, Bernie Madoff. Although I don't think he cared, he, I don't think he was particularly scrupulous in his dealings. <laughs> Right. So there's a, so, there's a social graph analysis. Can, can I ask that if everyone has a question, just please come up to the microphones? I'm, I'm happy to repeat the, the questions okay. as well. If you, but, are, if you are, but I think uh, it would just be helpful. Yep. So, so, the, so the idea that, that you're leaking your social graph to the public key servers is a concern. Um, now, I would submit that most people, if you have, if, sorry, I'm going to do another hand raise. Who here has a Facebook account that they used in the last week? Who here has a Facebook account, period? <laughs> if it's deactivated, it's still there, right? <laughs> um, so, so if you use Facebook, oh, if you have fa fake ones, that's good. There's chaff. Throw some sand in the cogs of the machine, please. Um, but um, yeah, if you have a Facebook account, you're leaking at least as much information, um, if not more, most likely more, than anything that simply says, I believe I know who's, what key goes with this name, right? When you sign someone's key, the only thing you're doing is you're making an identity certification. You're not attesting that this person is um, a good person. You're not attesting that you like them. You don't even have, you're not even saying anything about what you think about their cooking, right? The only thing you're saying is this person goes with this key and that's it. Sorry, he, he says, we're also saying that their email address is, and yes, that's right. You're, you're, connecting, you're connecting these three pieces of information. Their, their, their name, if it's present in the user ID, the email address, if it's present in the user ID, and the public key. So that's what you're asserting. You're not asserting anything else. So if you see a certification from me on somebody's key, you shouldn't take that to mean, oh, this person can, you know, is fine as a fine house guest. Let them stay at your house, <laughs> right? Um, all it says is this is their key. And, and so it's important that we remember that as we're looking at these sort of networks of certification. Um, that's, so this is actually one of the reasons that I like to, to avoid the term web of trust is because I think it's important that we see it as a network of identity certification and there's no statements about trust in it at all actually. Um, there's some weird corners of the spec that allow you to make statements of trust in the public network. No one uses them and no one should use them. Um, so that's, that's present. Um, so we talked a little bit about the dangers there. Um, so I want to talk about the concrete tool itself and what's going on, because we're, we're talking about the future of the protocol sort of more broadly, but I want to make sure that you understand some of what's going on with the tool as well, because if you use um, free software distributions, you're dependent on GNU-PG in a lot of cases. So GNU-PG currently maintains three different branches of development. Um, so that's 1.4, which is known as classic, 2.0, which is known as stable, and 2.1, which is known as modern. Um, on some systems, you'll find that GNU-PG and 2.0, so 
Classic is co-installable with either stable or modern, but these two are not co-installable. You either have one or you have the other. Um, when, the, when, when I say co-installable, that means that on your operating system, you can have GPG, that's GPG 1.4, and GPG 2, and that's one of these other ones. Um, and, there, and upstream, that is, the GNU PG developers explicitly support that use case. So what are the differences between these different things? GNU PG 1.4, the classic model, everything is bundled into basically one binary, which is the GPG binary, that can do all the different things, um, and, uh, and, it, and it's all basically self-contained. There's, um, it uses very few external libraries, um, has very few external dependencies, it's something that you could run on a very stripped down server. Um, GNU PG 2.0 has a much more modular architecture. They've broken out, for example, all of the underlying cryptography the mathematical operations into a library called gcrypt. Um, and so to use 2.0, you need gcrypt to be available. Um, uh, 2.0 also introduced the agent, which is a passphrase cache that can run side-by-side uh, uh, -side with GPG so that you don't have to type your passphrase every time you need to do a secret key operation. Right? Your secret key locally is often uh, protected by a passphrase, so it's encrypted by a passphrase. And in order to do any secret key operations, the secret key operations are decrypt and sign, then you need the passphrase. Chris? Uh, how does uh, GNU PG verify that the gcrypt it gets is the right one? Uh, it relies on the same way that anytime you load a library, that's, uh, it's just relies on the, the operating system's library loading. Um, GPG also runs in, you know, in, it's a regular process. It runs in your, uh, you know, in memory space that's accessible by your program. If your local software is compromised, GPG will not save you. Uh, nothing will save you. If your local <laughs> software is compromised, you're kind of out of the game. So um, this is why, and this is why we use GPG so that we don't end up running arbitrary software that we f fetched off the internet. We can verify the signatures on the app repositories and things like that. So yeah, I mean, you're right. There, in terms of places where things can break, library loading is yet another place where things could break. Um, so 2.0 introduced this, this uh, it uses libraries, it uses a, an agent to handle passphrase caches so that if you're decrypting 10 email messages, you only enter your passphrase once and, it, and the passphrase cache can be replayed. Um, it also introduces support within GNU PG for non-open PGP uh, crypto, in particular for SMIME, which is the message encryption and signing format that aligns more with the, the certificate authority approach. So, um, so GPG provides both SMIME services as of 2.0 as well as open PGP services. Um, so then the modern branch um, is where things are really starting to shift. Um, so uh, the, the modern branch was only released this year. 2.1 was, it, it was, it, it was started, the development started four years ago, and it's taken a really long time to get it out the door. But it's finally out. And now we have a bunch of stuff available to us that we didn't have before. So here's what we have. So in addition to breaking out the agent, it updates the agent. So the agent now is not just a passphrase cache, but for OpenPGP, the agent can actually store the secret key itself. And as a result, the GPG process doesn't actually ever see the secret key material. Instead, it can talk to the agent and say, hey, I hear you've got secret key X, and I need to do this secret key operation with it. Can you give me the result of the secret key operation? And that's a better situation because it means that the agent can be kept either, it could be run as a different user, it can be run in its own process space, it can be protected in other ways, and then your secret key material, which is really sort of the, um, the, the, the crown jewels, as it were, of, of your identity get, get to be isolated from the rest of the process. Um, so, so that's a nice improvement. We have the directory manager, Derman, Derminger, uh, I've never heard it pronounced. Um, and what this does is this takes all of GNU PG's network access and moves it out to a separate process. So if you think there's something sketchy going on on the network, maybe they can take over Derminger, but they can't actually directly interact with GPG. When would GPG go to the network normally? Like talking to key servers. And for the SMIME work, it uses it to update, to like check for revocation lists, certificate revocation lists and OCSP status messages and things like that. Um, the GPG agent, what's the interface between that and the main GPG program? Like if you wanted to, if you were in a, had a high security need and you wanted to put one 
uh, on a different box from the other and connect across a serial link. So what's the minimal uh, interface between the two? Um, so the interface, it uses a mechanism called ASUAN. It's a library, A-S-S-U-A-N. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a, like a Unix domain socket interface. Um, so you could set up a, a forwarding pipe with, with such a socket. Um, there's also uh, a couple of implementations that are starting to come out. Uh, one in particular is a, a smart card implementation that could potentially run free software on the smart card that provides an ASUON socket. And then you could just run effectively the agent itself on the smart card. That's not, that's not in place yet, but that I think would be an ideal approach for the kind of thing that you're imagining. Um, so um, the other thing is that currently launching, so launching the, the GPG agent currently is a complicated process that often gets done wrong. Um, and the 2.1 now has auto starting daemons that works a lot better in most cases than the old crazy um, passing around environment variables thing used to work. Um, there are still some problems with this, particularly I think if you have a home directory that's mounted on a remote file system, then the daemon auto start is gonna be a little more complicated. Um, if, you, if you're in that scenario and you wanna think about that with me and you're, you're trying to use secure secret key material across a remote home file system, I'd like to talk to you about it. So find me afterwards and we can go into detail. Um, and then the other thing is that 2.1 has really started to try to address some of the UI. Um, now, it's got a long way to go, but things like the comment are gone from the standard interface. And a lot of the initial questions that you might get asked, like when you set up a key, I'm gonna ask you about what crypto system to use and how big should the key be? And most of those questions, which normal users can't actually answer, are gone. So there's just a de there's some default modes that are totally streamlined now. You can get to those detailed questions because GPG is still a toolkit. It's not just uh, direct for user interface. But, the, but the, the common workflows we're trying to provide very simple, um, clean ways to get at those. And we're gonna encourage those as the, the ways that people should use the tool in the future. We've also removed support for all the old PGP v3 stuff um, that we know is bad. And we've added elliptic curve cryptography, which is a new uh, asymmetric crypto system. Um, so, um, so this is a, a, actually quite a big batch of changes um, and should be available, available to you now. Um, if you run Debian and you're running unstable, you can add the experimental repositories and pull it in. I believe Gentoo has it and a bunch of other distros I think are starting to package up the GNU PG 2.1 stuff. Um, if you pick up 2.1, should you switch to elliptic curve keys? The answer is probably no at the moment. Um, and the answer is no because other people aren't running 2.1 yet. So if you, have a two, if you have an elliptic curve key and you send it to somebody else and they're running an older version, they'll say, I don't know what this is, it looks malformed, I'm gonna throw it away. So, I mean, you could start using it, but with, only with the knowledge that you're only gonna be able to use it with other people who have already upgraded to, to the, the newer version. Yep, I want to bring up another uh, like point of criticism to the GPGS, especially the latest build, the latest versions. Mm -hmm. Like this uh, is about, GPG is designed and meant to be used as a like, uh, human utility. So it basically most common line interface with parameters, which is like definitely a good way to communicate with human, but very bad if you want to do something automatically. Like, for example, most distributions still have the uh, version, uh, first version of GPG to be able to generate like key completely without like user interaction. Mm -hmm. And only in the latest builds of the two, version 2.1, this feature appears. Right. And a lot of projects actually who want to utilize GPG in terms of API wise, they need to basically to run it and parse the command line output. So any like uh, steps to resolve this yes. kind of issue? So that criticism I think is completely correct. <laughs> uh, I think that GNU PG for years has tried to be both a user tool and a programmatic tool and it's very difficult to get either of those right on their own, and it's like 10 times more difficult to try to do both of those in the same utility. There's a couple of tools that have done it, but GNU PG is not one of them. <laughs> um, so I do think that the 2.1 series is actually doing a better job at trying to think about what are some of the common scriptable use cases and how can we improve them. Um, and they've also made it much more, um, they've made, there are certain modes that you can put GPG in that provide machine parsable output. 
and they've they've done a much better job in recent versions of trying to produce that kind of machine parsable output. Is that going to be enough to use it as you know as a shim in some kind of API? I don't know. I think the jury's still out on that. But there's there's movement in that direction. And when people report bugs and say I'm trying to use it in this way and I needed the API to work, I, I needed I needed something better, some better way to work with it programmatically. Um, Recently, actually, there's been a lot of willingness on the part of new PG Upstream to say, oh, you need, you need to do that? Well, nobody asked us for that before, so we'll just put it in. Um, so I agree with you. It's, it, it's an atrocious API. Um, it may be even worse of an API than it is a, user, a, a UI, uh, but, but it's improving. So um, if you have other suggestions about ways it could be improved, I'm happy to help you file bugs, or if, if you want to point them out to me, I'll file the bugs for you. Um, but yeah, so that's that's definitely uh, an issue. And like you said, to programmatically create a new key with a given user ID, in the new versions, it's now a single command. You say quick gen key or something like that, and you give it the user ID right on the command line, and it just creates the key and puts it in the key ring, and it's all ready. So that's why, like, the uh, Postgres and the uh, Egyptian distribution, so the Postgres and the Egyptian, they have some, you know, some other people in Bondo have the same Yeah. So he's saying that the the reason that we're that the distros have um, have kept some of the older versions around is because different versions um, are scriptable in slightly different ways, and as we move to two point one, that should be more. Um, we we should be hopefully able to move all the way to that. I would love to see us support fewer versions of GPG. I actually think this is kind of a crazy masochistic arrangement for software development. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. Um, so if you're interested in these things, there's a lot of places that you could go to actually um, participate in the development to learn about um, some of the details, um, to maybe guide some of the process. If, you're, if you have uh, user interface skills, if you have programming skills, GNU PG is all in C. Um, there are other implementations that are in different languages, including uh, JavaScript and Python implementations, um, depending on what, your, what kind of itches you like to scratch. Um, if you want to get involved, we need people who are sensible and thinking about this stuff and, um, we, you know, to, to produce things that are going to actually be useful. So if you're interested in any of this and you want to actually work on more of it, I recommend um, uh, a couple different places. So if you want to look at the standard and think about how the standard itself should change, um, this is the, the IETF mailing list here. Um, so I'm going from sort of the... Well, there's different kinds of abstractions, right? This is a very technical abstraction. Um, if you're interested in the GNU PG development, the mailing list, again, is the way to go. There's a GitHub group right now that's being maintained uh, by a handful of people, including Brennan Novak, who worked on MailPile client. Um, this is actually really interesting stuff going on here because it's very user-focused, user-centric. So there's interest in trying to create shared vocabularies around these tools, right? We just, we talked through a ton of stuff. I, I even skipped over a bunch of my terminology slides because I didn't want to bog down in them. Um, but we have a hard time communicating about this stuff. It, it, it can be confusing. And if we want mass adoption, we need to figure out exactly what does need to be communicated and make sure that we're not saying it in four different ways that confuse other people. So the modern PGP project is trying to establish common vocabularies across open PGP implementations and common icons for people who are providing user interface so that you know, like, oh, this message had this thing happen to it. And it should look similar even if you're, if you're using tool X versus if you're using tool Y. You shouldn't have to relearn the whole thing every time you go, right? The send button in your email client looks like a send button pretty much everywhere. So the, this is messages encryption, encrypted. Those kind of messages should look the same. Um, this is also good if you're, if you're someone who knows multiple languages. You know, as we try to coalesce on, around standard vocabulary in English, we need to coalesce around a similar standard, standard vocabulary in other languages so that other people have this available. Oh, uh, just wanted to let you know there's a, a project called RetroShare mm -hmm. that uses OpenPGP as its encryption engine. Yep. And it does a whole myriad of things. Um, I'm just wanting to know what your take on that project. So I, mean, I haven't actually used RetroShare. I don't think I can provide too much in the way oh, of okay. uh, detailed comments on it. Okay. But it's just, it's very versatile. There's a uh, file encryption and messaging and, yep. and uh, you know, email and all kinds of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's nice to see that you can update this stuff. So that'll work better. Yep. So yeah, I wish I, I wish I had more knowledge about RetroShare. I don't, I don't actually have uh, much. It's, it's just an interesting, yeah. fun project that you can, you know, have like 
say you have 10 friends, you can have a little private network mm -hmm. and it uses OpenPGP as the underlying technology to keep everything secure. Okay, cool. So it's pretty neat. So you mentioned one of the reasons to not necessarily upgrade to 2.1 and use uh, use Oat to Curve as your uh, as your uh, oh, sorry. technology. Let me just state mm -hmm. that more clearly because I don't want to. I don't. Sorry, th those were an and, not one or the other. But yes. right. So 2.1 doesn't only support elliptic curve; it also supports all of the traditional mechanisms or many of the traditional mechanisms. Um, what's your feeling in general about elliptic uh, the security of uh, the elliptic uh, curve algorithms that are are being uh, about because I think there's always a little bit of suspicion about those things when yes. news been so sorry there's been a bunch of arguments about I had a slide here um, it might be back here in the there we go um, so there's been a bunch of arguments about elliptic curve crypto and uh, ways that elliptic curve crypto might itself be designed in a dangerous way right like that whoever whoever made the designs may have a backdoor and the classic example of that is a random number generator that NIST standardized called dual EC DRBG. And that was standardized by NIST, the um, National Institute for Standards and Technology, part of the US government, basically because the NSA came to NIST and said, this is a good one, you should standardize this. Um, and it turns out that it's a bad random number generator. It's designed in such a way that anybody who knows a particular secret that's unrelated to your computer if they can tell that you're using this random number generator, then they can actually, pro and they see the output of your random number generator, then they can actually probably see, they can probably figure out what your random number generator is doing and figure out other things that you may not have published. And some crypto systems like DSA break very, very badly if your random number generator is predictable. So this is an example, dual ECDRBG is a random number generator that's based on elliptic curve mathematics, and it is probably backdoored and compromised, and so people have a lot of fear right now around elliptic curves. And I think that fear is understandable. Um, the actual elliptic curve math that's being used here is not dual ECDRBG. It's, a, it's different particular protocols. But the curves that are being used are curves that also came effectively from NIST, probably from the NSA. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of cryptographers who looked at them. And these are called the NIST curves. And these are the ones that are currently standardized. Um, there's, there's three curves. It's P256 and P384 and P521. That, those relate to the sizes of the curve. Um, and they, they are generated with parameters that came from a process that looks relatively suspicious. Um, but a lot of cryptographers have looked at them and have not figured out even a sketch of how you would go from, of, of what the break might be for those suspicious curves. But if you don't trust those curves, and it's fine by me if you don't trust those curves. There's a new set of curves that are being standardized, but, and this is the CFRG, the Crypto Forum Research Group within the Internet Research Task Force. Um, and the curves that they're working on standardizing are curves that come from people like Dan Bernstein and Mike Hamburg. Um, and Dan Bernstein and Mike Hamburg are folks who um, I think have a lot of uh, cryptographic experience and I don't know how people feel about them, but these curves are not coming from NIST. They're not coming from the NSA. And there's pretty good evidence that, that this is a sort of separate provenance. So I'm excited about the fact that we're, work, we're in the process now of standardizing these new curves, curve 25519 and uh, Goldilocks 448 are the two curves um, within the CFRG. And I hope we will put them into the new OpenPGP spec that we're working on. And uh, the, actually, that, that was uh, not the main question I was going to ask, but it was a great answer. Thank you. Um, the, the main question I was going to ask was when you talk about the adoption of uh, newer things, the, outside of just the community that is primarily uh, working with uh, GPG and, and signing software, when you get down to uh, email and communications, what kind of adoption do you see for the standards that you're helping to, to write and the implementations that you are uh, helping people to uh, be aware of and, and to work with? So email adoption, in, encrypted e in, adoption of encrypted email is incredibly low. Um, and it's low for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with the crypto systems that are in use. I think it's low because um, we've been fixated for many years on figuring out the exact right key management problem instead of taking the tofu approach or sort of the moxie approach which says, eh, have a centralized authority and rely on that until things get up and running and hopefully that won't break for too many people, right? Get the keys in people's hands, get them using it first, and, that'll, and that'll, that should make it easier for people to adopt. Um, we don't actually have a lot of adoption yet. 
um, on any of these tools. You know, OpenPGP, despite being 24 years old, um, is used by a tiny, tiny fraction of all of all email users. So, the ways that we can improve adoption, I think, are are maybe orthogonal to the underlying cryptographic security. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, uh, there are user interface issues. And frankly, I actually think for email, where people's workflow tends to be um, archive, much later, retrieve, search, um, we haven't answered how to do that kind of thing right properly yet. So if all my email is encrypted and my archive is indexing the cipher text, it doesn't help me search. So now I have to index the clear text. If I index the clear text, then my index now becomes vulnerable. So where do I store my index? So there are questions like that that have a couple of different kinds of answers, some very sort of, you know, what you would come up with in five minutes if you just made something up like, oh, well, I'll encrypt my index, and then that gets stored somewhere else, which may be fine. And then other than are like super complicated, fancy mathematical stuff of private information retrieval where your database is, your index is stored among 16 different providers, none of whom trust each other, um, and you get to send them queries and they don't even have any idea what you're looking for, but they give you the information that you can reassemble to find what you want. Um, I think those are neat, but I don't think that those are particularly pragmatic. So problems like that are problems that we need to solve to increase the adoption rates. And the adoption rates are poor right now. Uh, hi, uh, just two things. One is a quick comment on the curve parameters. Um, there are not many people out there who know how to validate them, and there are even fewer, even among cryptographers, very few who know how to generate curve parameters. Uh, it's a very difficult process compared to like older like DSA parameters or RSA uh, keys. Um, so just one thing to think about if you're using elliptic curves is there's maybe 100 people in the world that you're trusting for all of that. Um, the other is just a quick question. Uh, is the new, I haven't kept up to date on the new OpenPGP standard, is it using ECDSA or have has there been a movement towards sort of better algorithms with better security arguments like Schnorr or like these other new things? Um, so the status, let me give you a status update. Thank you for that. I think that's, that's absolutely right and people should take that to heart. There, it, This is specialized knowledge here for the crypto pieces for ECC. Um, the the status update on the on the new uh, the new OpenPGP spec is that it's totally in its infancy, um, as in like there isn't even a draft of what might become uh, they call them BIS right the forty the twenty four forty BIS became forty eight eighty the forty eight eighty BIS is only hasn't even been published as a draft yet so there's no there's not even like a, a thing to work from that might happen next week um, but it will be probably at least uh, I expect it to be at least a year process to, to finalize that draft. And the question about what signature algorithms are we using, that is up for discussion. Well, not just signatures, but in general. I mean, most of what's in PGP now has these various levels of ad hoc or not well understood constructions versus yep. the past 20 years of work on it. Exactly. And so one of the main goals of the, the work that's, right, we're in the process of rechartering the Open PGP Working Group within the IETF. Um, and one of the main goals of that process is going to be to convert all of the crypto systems to be using standard constructions that we know how to analyze, that have cryptanalysis, um, and and that avoid some of the failure modes like the DSA, you know, random number generator failure modes. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, like, uh, sorry for bothering you. Like, uh, the thing is, like, there's some weirdness I noticed when I was looking at the UID prefs, you know, with under the keys, right? Like, I mean. Like, as far as the symmetric en encryption algorithms, they're okay. It's like AES-256, AES-192, AES-128, CAST-5, which is okay. I'd rather it not be there. Tripled as is required for OpenPGP compliance. But then, of course, there's idea floating around, which it should not be doing. Like, and I mean, it's even worse for, like, you know, the hash algorithms. Like, SHA-256 is first, which is fine. But then there's SHA-1, and then, like, SHA-5 right. as well. And, like, it's weird. And, like, I, I looked in the documentation for some sort of sane explanation I couldn't find. I went to the source code and like under, you know, slash g10 slash yeah. gen dot c, I saw like this weird comment, something about because SHA-3 is gonna be available, they're putting SHA-1 right. before SHA-3. So, why? why? So, okay, so let me, let, me, let me explain that to folks who haven't looked as deeply into it as you have, um, and, then I can, and then I'll try to answer your question. So, within your OpenPGP certificate, you can include an indication of what preferences, what cryptographic algorithms you prefer to use. 
So you can say, I prefer to use uh, this particular digest, or I prefer to use this particular symmetric cipher, or I prefer to use, uh, th th there's a number of other small parameters that you can set, and you can announce your preferences. And that way, when someone sends you an encrypted mail, because they have your full certificate, they can decide what algorithms to use um, so, that, so that you will read it, right? So you can actually tweak those parameters in your certificate, and you can say, actually, I prefer only AES-256. Don't send me anything else. Um, and, uh, but the default, when, when you create a new key in OpenPGP with, with GNU-PG, Right. I mean, I just said, I don't want GNU-PG to ask all these questions about key size and things like that. Well, I certainly don't want GNU-PG to ask lots and lots of questions about, you know, what are your symmetric cipher preferences? Because most users have no, absolutely no idea about that. So the defaults are important. Just like the defaults, they don't make sense. I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, right. should be changed. I, I, can actually, I, I was actually thinking of bringing this up on the mailing list yes. later on. Yes, so, so the defaults have actually been changed in the last year. Um, and many of us, so I share your concerns. Um, the, the defaults that used to be in place were terrible defaults. In fact, I believe SHA-1 was preferred over any of the other digest algorithms, for example, until last year. Um, so many, and for example, the default key size was uh, an RSA key of 1024 bits up until a couple of years ago, or th maybe three years ago. Also, so, speaking of, you know, the obvious stuff when they ask for the key length, I mean, 3,072 bits is what you need for 128 bits of security. Why yes. Still so, yes. Yeah. So, so... There have been modifications to the defaults, and it's an ongoing process to try to encourage the defaults to shift in the right direction. I agree with you that the defaults are not great right now. They're better than they were, and upstream, the GNU-PG maintainers are moving in the right direction. They've been very reluctant to make large changes, and the reason that they often give when they're asked about this, and this does come up fairly regularly, is that they want to preserve interoperability with old implementations. I actually think we're at a stage today given what we know about the network, what we know about software updates, what we know about crypto, that we can push back more effectively and people will hear us better by saying, if you are stuck using a cryptographic implementation from uh, 2010, five years old, you're probably screwed anyway. <laughs> and, and so we should not be coddling your implementation. So therefore our defaults should reflect the best modern practices. So what, would, what it's going to take to, to shift those defaults even further in the right direction. So I want to point out they have shifted already some in the right direction. And to shift them further in the right direction, we need to make sure that we have standards documents coming out that endorse the changes that we want to see endorsed and that we have regular good communication with the, with the developers. And it's also possible if, I don't know if you work with any of the distributions, but if you're a distributor of GNU-PG, you can change the defaults. And it's also conceivable that the distributions could say, you know what, Upstream doesn't want to make this change, but we understand cryptographically it's the right thing to do, so we're going to go ahead and make the change anyway. And that's something that we've been talking about within the Debian. I'm part of the GNU-PG packaging team within Debian, and we've been talking about that within, within the GNU-PG packaging team, and there's, I think, a fair amount of willingness to decide, okay, we're going to actually probably go ahead and update the defaults if GNU-PG doesn't do it. And that may then prove to Upstream that it's okay to do. Just so that's a process towards, the, towards what you're asking about. The funny thing is some of, like, I've seen... I know people who made keys like, you know, and they're of Debian squeeze on Debian stable, and they actually had better, you know, you would perhaps than the newer implementation. They, they may be making their keys, um, they, may be use, they may be customizing the keys that they create. So if you're interested in making sure that you've got something that's like meets all of the, the good standards, there's a, this URL I here. This article, yeah. I, I apologize that this is so lo such a long URL. <clears throat> um, but this actually has a bunch of advice about creating keys that will override some of the existing standards and make sure that your key comes out with a bunch of uh, parameters that are, that are stronger um, than what the defaults are gonna be. I actually think the defaults are probably good for most people already, and I actually, I am more concerned with our complete decades of user interface fail than I am with the weak defaults, because with the weak defaults are bad, I grant, but the user interface fail means nobody uses the tool at all, which is even worse. If you use this, if you're interested in this, by the way, you might also be interested in, in, a, in a, a suite called uh, HOpenPGP Tools, HopenPGP Tools, which is a Haskell implementation. Um, sorry to call you out, um, but made by somebody here um, that actually takes some of these requirements that are listed in this web page and looks at your key or any key that you feed it and, and says it meets this, it doesn't meet that, it, it does this, right, this thing right and it does that other thing right. So, sorry, there's another question right here behind you. 
Usability question. Yeah. Uh, going back to your slide on what keys you should or shouldn't sign, you know, some uh, some of us actually have uh, offline uh, master certification key. Yep. And so what's your opinion on whether such keys should be signed by others and specifically if they don't have any email or name on them? Sure. So. Um, so let me just describe the setup that you described yep. uh, more in more detail because I think that's useful. So actually, I'm going to switch back to my certificate image just to be able to point at some things. Um, uh, all right. So an open PGP certificate has this primary key that's used for certification. And then these different sub keys can be used for different things like um, encryption and signing messages, for example, or SSH authentication, or other things. Um, the, the setup that he just described, sorry, he just described, is that what you can actually do is you can take your secret key material for this primary key, and you can move it out of your key ring. So it's not actually present um, on your operating system that you use every day at all. So if your machine was to be compromised, the only thing they would get access to, that the attacker would get access to, would be the secret key material for your sub keys, and not for your primary key. So this is kept offline. Maybe it's in an air-gapped machine, or maybe it's just in some ratty old laptop you keep under the couch, um, which may itself be air-gapped. Um, <laughs> but then uh, the advantage of that is that you end up protecting this much better. This is, is like I said, this is sort of the key. This is this is your your crown jewels for your identity. Um, if you keep it offline, you're much less likely to get it to be broken. Um, so, uh, so one of your questions was should you certify this key, right? So in the scenario where I've broken up my, my secret key material, the only thing you're certifying is the primary key anyway, so you should be willing to certify keys whether or not the master key is offline. And one of the, I mentioned in my little rant about open PGP comments, one of the things that I mentioned was people tend to stick stuff in the comment that maybe is irrelevant. Sometimes people put in their comment parenthesis offline signing key, and then they have a whole separate open PGP certificate that's for regular use. That, I think, is a mistake of the user, like uh, the user who controls the key. If you're going to have your offline signing key, just have it offline. You don't need to put it in your user ID. And people, when they're certifying the user ID, they don't need to know or verify. Like, what you're asking them to certify that it's offline. I don't know if, you're, if your master key is offline. I hope it is. Um, so, but, but because you can do this split and operate on a daily basis with your sub keys, then, yeah, go ahead and keep that bit offline. Now, if the user ID has a name but no email address, and your question is, should I certify that? Well, I say certify it if you believe that name binds to that particular person, if you're comfortable with that. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, then don't certify it. But I don't know that you need to have a, an email address in your user ID for me to sign it, for example. Um, other people may make the deci that decision differently, but what I care about is that that name is bound to that key. Now, you could have three user IDs, one of which doesn't have an email address, and two of which do have email addresses. <clears throat> you could even have a fourth user ID that is totally unrelated to the other three, that claims that you're Barack Obama and that your email address is president at whitehouse.gov. Um, I would only certify the first three user IDs, and I wouldn't certify the fourth, because I actually don't think that you're Barack Obama. But the point here is that the way that this is, this, is this is all composable, so you can make your decision separately on the basis of which particular user ID, what you believe <coughs> about each particular one. Um, uh, I want to make one more comment about that kind of approach where you keep your, you keep your primary key offline and you have your subkeys active. Whether you keep your primary key offline or not, the subkeys are things that are bound, I mean, if you look at the way this is constructed, the third-party certifications say nothing about the subkeys, right? So that means that it's just the primary key who gets to decide which subkeys are valid or not. So one thing that you can do is you can issue new subkeys regularly, right? So I can say, here's a subkey. It's good for a year. You can encrypt to it. And then within maybe six months from now, I'll issue a new encryption-capable subkey. And I'll gradually retire that one. And then a year, you know, another year out, I'll issue a new encryption-capable subkey and retire the old one. And as a result, as long as people are refreshing their keys from the key servers, they'll, see, they'll, be, they'll always be able to encrypt to me. But anyone who compromises one of my encryption-capable keys can only actually get, I'm assuming, of course, that this someone who compromises it has actually been copying all of my emails, 
right? Well, if, they, if they're doing that and they've got my whole email archive, they only get access to a portion of it, the portion that was encrypted to that key. So it's a way of bounding the limitations and the risks here. Um, similarly, you can do that with your signing capable subkeys or your authorization subkeys. So I actually recommend you can do this kind of key rotation um, and it also lets you know which of your correspondents are not refreshing the keys regularly. So one thing that I advise is that if you keep, a, if you use OpenPGP, you should, and this, this was on that page that, that I had the link up to, refresh your keys regularly. Refresh the certificates from the key servers regularly. Because if you don't, you won't get this, a revocation, right? When my key is compromised, I will publish a revocation certificate to the key servers. If you don't check the key servers, you don't know that my key has been compromised. And similarly, if I'm doing this key rotation thing, you won't get the subkey unless you've refreshed it. So if you use OpenPGP, if you use GNU PG, just do GPG space dash dash refresh if you don't care about leaking who's in your key ring. If you do care about who's leaking what's in your key ring, you can use a tool called Parsimony, um, which is spelled just like it sounds, I claim, um, that will use Tor circuits to connect uh, to different key servers over Tor um, and fetch your key ring one key at a time from different key servers via different Tor networks to reduce the amount of leakage that can happen there. Um, in addition to Persimony, we're working on getting a dash dash use dash Tor option for GPG itself. This is a much shorter and I hope an entertaining answer. Um, if you are in a big organization that uses Kerberos, for example, yep. what would you tell such a place? If I'm in a big organization that uses Kerberos, I would say good for you because <laughs> most big organizations are using something much worse than Kerberos. <laughs> um, uh, so Kerberos, the, the arrangement for Kerberos is that there's a centralized authority, right? And everybody has a shared secret with that centralized authority. And that's a very different model than any sort of asymmetric crypto system. There are ways that you can set up Kerberos, it's called PK init, that uses an asymmetric system so you keep a secret key and you prove your possession of the secret key to the centralized authority. And then it grants you the various tickets and things to talk to the other parties in the ecosystem. PK init is designed, it's packaged all in X509, which is the sort of certificate authority model. So I don't see any immediate integration between Kerberos and OpenPGP. If you wanted to try to like wrangle a PK init modification that uses OpenPGP, that would be kind of interesting. I don't know anybody who's, who's doing that. Um, I think the models are fairly different, right? Kerberos assumes centralized authority for the whole organization. OpenPGP is a much more sort of flat um, and, and flexible arrangement. So, yeah? Uh, well, I have two more questions. Like, I mean, maybe I misunderstood the OpenPGP spec, but I think I found a bug in GNU PG. Like, what I was trying to do was I wanted to create, like, one master key for certification and three separate subkeys for authentication, encryption, and signing, right? Yep. And what I wanted to do was I wanted distinct passphrases for each of these four. Yep. However, when I tried changing the passphrase for one, it changes it for everything, and I can't figure out how to break out of that, and that rather nullifies, you know, the advantages of the subkeys, because, like, say I want to decrypt something, I type in my passphrase, right? And okay. then someone gets the signing part, which is on, on my computer, the yep. signing part gets that. So, so, the other so, so, I, so I understand the, um, the goal that you have there, um, and I agree that GNU PG doesn't, handle that use case well right now. Um, I think that's a special customized use case, and I think we should probably, I think it's better for GNUPG to focus on find, dealing with the use case for everyone than focusing on that one, but if you want to try to fix it, I could probably help you look at where what it would take to fix it in the code. Um, it doesn't nullify the advantages of having separate subkeys, though. The advantage of having separate subkeys is because the public key, the use of the public key crypto system it could be that there's a protocol mismatch between the, say, SSH authentication and message signing. So that if you use the same key to both sign messages and prove your identity in SSH, it might be that when you talk to server X, it says, oh, well, you claim you're you, prove that you're you, and you do whatever the SSH operation is, and it says, aha, thank you. That, that signature is just what I needed. I will now craft an email that appears to come from you, and I will take that operation that you did that people can verify and apply it to that email and make an email that appears to be signed as you. It's nothing to do with your passphrase, right? 
It's th this would this is this would be called a cross protocol attack. But like still, if there's like a keylogger or something, it could be used. If there's a key, if there's a key, the if there's a keylogger, there, that's a that's a separate concern, and that's not why we have separate separated use separated subkeys. But still, sir, like separate passphrases would help. Say I want say I want to decrypt something encrypted to me, but I don't want to sign it. My sign signing Excuse key doesn't get compromised. My yeah, I'm so sorry to have to interrupt, but we're coming on to eight thirty. Maybe you guys can talk about yep. this after the presentation, and afterwards. we can take a yep. last question. Last question. More generalized question, so maybe it's a good way to end this. Sounds good. Do you have, or do you know of any data that's available on why it's just not being adopted the way it should be? I don't know what that data would look like. Um, it would be a good questionnaire to get out on mass. Yeah. So, th be so there, are, there are a couple of people who send out questionnaires, but they send it to, they tend to send out questionnaires to people who do use e the cryptographic right. email, right. which isn't very useful, right? Right. Um, I, um, so what I have, so, so what, we, what we do have is we have usability studies of you know, people who do user interface UX design who say we're gonna sit, we're gonna take an open PGP related project and we're gonna sit regular users in front of it and we're gonna ask them to use it. And so this goes back all the way to why Johnny can't encrypt, which is a paper that was, it's a classic paper. If you haven't read this paper, I recommend reading it um, about the different ways that the user interface fails. Um, uh, and we have anecdotal, I, anecdotal evidence from anyone who's ever tried to deploy this in a wide scale about, about some of the problems that people run into. But I don't know that we have um, large amounts of data. So if you know of a way to do it, or if you can think about it, or if you hear about it, talk to me. I would be happy to, um, to learn more about that. I'm not sure what that data would look like, but I agree with you that that would be very useful. So okay. thanks, everybody, for staying Yeah, so it's, uh, it's trivia time. Um, so we have a few books. Hopefully, DKG has a few questions, yeah. and maybe some people have answers. Um, so okay, here we go. And um, so the rules are: it's the first person who we call on who uh, answers. Are you going to do just, the calling on? I'll I'll do it. Uh, sometimes the presenter likes to do it, but I, I typically I try to move around and get a little bit of everyone. I'm sorry, it's very unfair, but it's just how it works. Best okay. So, so uh, question one is: what year? was the first RFC related to uh, PGP. I, I'll give it to you in the white shirt since, since you were so uh, eager and kept your hand up. I don't think that's correct. I'm sorry, do we have Behind a second? You? Red. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize it was gonna be such a tricky first I'm, I'm gonna call you right here. 1996. Yes, this man, get this man a prize. Come on over. So <laughs> take a choice of any of the books there or one of the ebook vouchers. So either way. Um, huh? <laughs> First you win, then you find out. Um, I just. So uh, can you name the um, two daemonized components of GNU PG 2.1? Um, over here, the gentleman asked the question earlier. Uh, the agent, and the agent and directory manager. All right. Grab yourself a book or a voucher. Um, uh, can okay. So, um, what are the names of the two groups that are specifying uh, elliptic curve cryptography? I saw your hand very. And quickly. what do they stand for? Oh. Oh, 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 does anyone want to? No, no, go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to ask for someone else uh, in the back. Uh, Simu, are you up to this? Uh, I, I saw his hand first, but why don't you go ahead, sir? Yes. So that's, that's, not, uh, that's not technically the group. Uh, IETF is not in the business of... I, I see a very uh, confident hand right here, and I'm sorry. So if, if, he, if he said someone else, then <laughs> we'll go, move on. Yeah, that's the right acronyms. <laughs> I actually don't know what the um, preposition is between standards and technology in this either. But I, I would have gone for that one. CFRG. It was mentioned. I, so, I, so give this man a prize. I'm Let's totally willing to be forgiven on that because I don't CFRG think, yeah. stands for. Okay, that's the next one. Does anyone know what CFRG stands for? Is that the question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, 
That would be CRFG, but that's close enough. Give him a prize. Okay, so we have two winners here. And um, um, so take your choices. Um, what is the name, including middle initial? Okay, just what is the name of the person who, who put PGP on the map? And if you can get the middle initial, that's... Uh, are you in the checkered answer. shirt? Yeah. All right. Get that man a prize then. Middle initial is... If anybody knows... So I, is it okay to have trivia that wasn't actually in the slides? That wasn't presented? Mm. Anybody know the middle initial? Uh, I'll just shout it out. I can't tell who said anything. Okay. Let's go for a different one then. Sorry. That, that one didn't work <laughs> out very well. Um, is it okay if we move on to a, a different question? Yeah. I think, the, I think the answer is R. I think it's Robert. You yeah. think it is? I, I do. I mean, okay, next question. I, mean, I've never I haven't seen his government-issued ID. You know? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, let's go for the next question. So, if we um, can you name um, three alternate certification mechanisms besides the web of trust? Um, you in the sweatshirt right here? All right. Nice. Nice recovery there. And I think uh, we that... have two books left. So this will be the last question. Um, and sorry, whoever's the last person, you only have one book to choose from. Um, so, um, yeah, what is the... Um, what is the number of the of the current specific the current RFC that is specifies uh, Open PGP? I, I think yep. Yeah. Forty eight eighty. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll be heading over to Bloom's Tavern uh, on Fifty Eighth Street between Second and Third, just uh, down the street to the east of here.